so I've sent you those the questions which I've now looked at yeah. and they look very wordy and <laughs> yeah well it's a bit like exams again yeah we, we can just have a chat can't we <laughs> it, I suppose that's the thing isn't it so it's, it's, it's mainly for our 90th birthday and we're looking yeah. At, at, at trying to get messages from people about about what it means to have a place like St George's Crips mm. within, within the city of Leeds, within Yorkshire as a as a as a wider a wider region. Um, so I suppose what does what does it mean to you to know that there are are places like the Crips that that, that fundamentally practice Christian practical Christian values and teachings? In my first response when I hear of places like St George's Crypt is you know, the, the tragedy that we need places like this. You know, I long for us to be in a world where you don't need it. Um, and it's a terrible indictment of our society that so many are poor, so many are in trouble, so many are homeless. And I also know that, you know, all of us are just a couple of steps away from homelessness. A couple of things can go wrong and it could happen to anybody. And we also know that many people who are homeless have got other difficult issues in their life, not least, you know, mental health problems. Uh, so my first thought is, it's a great sadness that, that in our world, there is a need for places like St George's Crypt, but that's quickly followed by great thanksgiving. Um, great thanksgiving uh, that Christian people and, and other people of goodwill um, want to make a space where first of all, people can be given back the dignity of their own humanity. That's what I find most inspiring. Yeah, I know that St George's, like other uh, places up and down the country, I know you do all sorts of wonderful, wonderful practical things. But I think the first and most important thing that happens is that somebody is given dignity, um, the dignity of a brother and sister. Uh, because I think Christian care proceeds from the understanding that, first of all, this could be any of us. Um, and secondly, that we offer hospitality to others as we would to Christ himself. Thankfully, there are people out there and that thankfully, be it Christian, be it, be it, be it, be it non-Christian, whatever, whatever one's denomination, thankfully, there are people out there that do and are willing to to, 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 to take on that work charitably. Yes, I mean, I am, um, you know, just on a personal level, my, um, my, f I was until a couple of months ago, the Bishop of Chelmsford serving Essex and East London. And uh, my father in his retirement dedicated a huge amount of his time to a charity in South End, uh, serving the homeless. Now it's, it's known as HARP. Um, which is a homelessness project in South End, and as I think will be well known, uh, often homeless people gravitate to, to seaside towns, and there's always a big issue of, of poverty in seaside towns and homelessness. Um, and I'm a patron of that charity. I've been very involved with that charity for you know, many years now, and yet yeah, hugely inspired by, by the work that they do. And I know it's the same work that goes on at St George's Crypt, um, and as I say, it's not just the practical stuff that you do, it's the, what I would call the spiritual stuff, you know, the stuff about our humanity, which is so important. Um, I could tell you a little story, but I don't know whether you want little stories. I am happy for a little story. You need story. to switch me off, I'll just keep whittering on Andrew. So <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, my, my favourite story about working with the homeless, this is a true story of, of a man who, um, again, as I say, homelessness is something that could easily happen to any of us. Um, just a couple of pieces of bad luck and, and any of us could find we're without a hope. Uh, so this man found himself homeless following losing his job, his marriage breaking up. He, he, he um, I think he turned to alcohol for comfort and suddenly he finds himself homeless. Um, uh, he turned up at the homelessness harp, the homelessness place, uh, looking for looking for some support in, in great need. They gave him a shower. They gave him a shave. They gave him a new set of clothes. That afternoon, he went out and got a job. Um, uh, for, you know, got the job and uh, and 
was able to get come into some sort of sheltered housing that the charity was supporting and his life was put back together again now it's not always that simple in fact it very rarely is that simple but sometimes it is all he needed was a shave and a shower and a, and a clean set of clothes to be able to just begin to get back onto the to the ladder of of what we would call normal life um and so this is an incredibly important work because once you slip out of the mainstream of life into the shadows of homelessness, it's very, very hard to get back again. Um, and, and therefore practical help is needed. Um, uh, and where that practical help is offered, people's lives can be put back together. No, well, we work, we work with, in fact, just today, um, we had someone coming back into the shelter um, and he's been on our drug and alcohol rehabilitation project um, for the past 14 months and he came back um, and you always you always see people with trepidation because you don't know whether they've come back and it's all bad <laughs> or whether they've come back and and things are, are on, a, on a better path but but no th thankfully He's now, he came back, he's got himself a job, he's working, and he's working supporting people who are similarly in homeless, in, 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 in homeless situations, doing, basically doing the work as a peer supporter, following up what he, what, the experiences that he, he went through. And I think it is, and we've got a fair few people doing things like that. And it, it is, as, as you say, it's, it's, it's not always the norm, but when you do see it, I think that it, it, it's a it's a brilliant thing to see, and <laughs> yeah, it is. And and I'm also aware that, and I'm sure it's true of St George's Crypt, that some of the people who work with you are those who have been in the past clients themselves, um, and who now want to give back. And of course, because they've been through that experience, that gives them um, uh, an ability to get alongside people. Uh, so that's also very, very inspiring to see. No, 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 no the person, the person, the person who, in fact, the person who runs the drug alcohol rehabilitation project, and his two assistants, are both. Well, they're all three of them are are recovered or recovering. I think they never they they say they yeah, never yeah. recover. So recovering addicts, yeah. and it, as you say, because they have that 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 lived experience. Mm. If they're able to to communicate and mm. and and see sort of see when people are slipping and see when people are, but anyway, I will get back to my, my, my second oh, yes. my second question. <laughs> so, but I suppose I'll I'll, 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 I'll truncate it a little bit because it, it looks like it goes on and on and on, doesn't it? But um, I suppose why do you why do you do you, or do you think and why do you think it's important to have have charities with an explicitly Christian foundation and core? working and especially working in this kind of work well i mean i think first of all i'd want to say that uh christians do not have a monopoly on care and compassion um and we rejoice and celebrate whenever we see goodness and beauty at work uh trying to make the world a better place so my my first response is that i don't mind who's caring for the homeless uh, as long as somebody is and i I would apply that to everything. So not only do I celebrate uh, all people of goodwill who are doing good things, um, I rejoice to work with them. And I think one of the things the church has got better at, I think, is working with others in these things and recognising we don't have a monopoly and we, we certainly don't have all the resources. So that's the first thing. But having said that, um, from a from a specifically Christian point of view, um, the teaching of Jesus makes it very clear. I mean, he says to his disciples on the night before he dies, um, this is how people will know that you are my followers, by your love. Um, Jesus himself washes his disciples' feet. He says, I am among you as one who serves. So we are most like Jesus, most faithful to his teaching when we exercise compassion and care, uh, seeking to meet the needs of the world. 
you know, when we, you know, I do believe there'll be a reckoning. Um, and when there is that day of reckoning and we stand before God to give an account, um, what's he going to say to us? Uh, what questions will he ask us? Um, well, I don't, I don't think he'll, you know, ask the questions that we tend to ask each other, you know, like, you know, what car do you drive? Where did you go on holiday? What job did you do? You know, what school did you go to? All, all the stuff that we do, which is usually about, you know, creating this human league table to see what position we come in, how, how well and successful we've been. God is fantastically not interested in all the things that we tend to obsess about. But I think what he will say is, um, did you did you care for the homeless? Did you feed the hungry? Did you visit the sick? Um, you know, whatever you did for the least of these, my sisters and brothers, you did to me. Um, so when we offer care, one, we are most like Jesus and therefore most attractive in our living out of the gospel, but also we meet Jesus in the poor, in the vulnerable, in the homeless. Um, it, it, it's not about just what we give to them, it's what we receive back. Um, and again, I know from my own experience that, uh, well, people often, you know, people often get embarrassed when they see a homeless person on the street, which I understand. It, it can feel a bit intimidating, especially if perhaps the person is, is on drugs or been drinking. Uh, it can be intimidating and one should be careful. Um, but people often don't know what to do and I either just hurry past or throw a couple of pounds into the into a cup to make themselves feel better. I've always tried to myself, though of course I don't always do it, but I've always tried myself and encouraged others to stop and have a chat, you know, provided it feels safe and there's other people around, stop and have a chat. Um, uh, it's always also been my practice to buy people food rather than give them money. Um, so if they ask for money, I usually say, what's the money for? They usually say for food. And I say, well, let me go and buy you some food. But I don't, but I try not just to give the food. I try, even it's just for a couple of minutes to stop and have a chat. Because I think when you, when you enter into some relationship with somebody, however brief, first of all, you're giving them back their humanity. Um, you're, you're treating them with worth and respect, but also there's so much to learn, um, so much to receive, uh, and so much blessing to be had from other people's stories, um, however hard and painful those stories often are. It's the difficulty of this is when you see someone in great need, well, I suppose that the, the, the an easy one is the Good Samaritan, isn't it? It's a very easy thing to walk right past and and not and not engage, and then for whatever reason one might not wish to engage. It's an easy thing to see someone there and think that's that's definitely not the kind of person that I want to be engaging with, and then hurry on by. The danger is that we say to ourselves. You know, those few pounds that I can give, that little bit of time that I can offer, what's that compared with all the need that there is in the world? And then you end up doing nothing and excusing yourself. And I think the other thing the Christian faith teaches us very, very powerfully is that one person can make a difference and that one small offering can make a difference. I mean, the story in the scriptures I often come back to is, you know, the feeding of the 5,000 where... You know, Jesus says to the disciples, you know, give give them something to eat. And they look at him incredulously. You know, you, you know, are you having a laugh? There's 5000 people here. You know, one month's wages wouldn't buy food for this lot. What are you on about? Um, uh, and then the one small boy offers his one small lunchbox and everyone is fed. Um, so what we we should turn this around and not say, oh, what will my little offering, you know, what, what will that do? Just say, well, actually, why my one little offering offered faithfully can have a transformative difference. You know, just like that man, all he needed was a shave and a shower. And actually, his life started to be turned around. It was a very, very small thing. Um, so we don't know what the small things we do. We don't know the difference they make. Um, at the same time, I think the church has a prophetic voice. Um, 
as a bishop, I'm a member of the House of Lords. I have a privileged opportunity to speak about things, you know, in, in, in the centre of our, of our government. Uh, and the church has a responsibility to speak out uh, on these moral issues about how we order our lives and our priorities. Um, and so Christians must do both. We must offer whatever we can, recognizing that even a, even a small offering can make a transformative difference. And at the same time, we need to cry out against the injustices of the world that create a world where so many are needlessly homeless. You know, I'm sure St. George's particularly is dealing with what you might call the visible homeless, mm -hmm. but I'm sure you're, you're aware there's a, a vast number of what you might call the hidden homeless. You know, people sleeping on sofas, people moving from, you know, bed to bed, people in bed sits, you know, families in temporary accommodation. I mean, they're not actually on the streets, but it is not the secure, stable home that I believe is the right of everybody. And so on those issues, the church really has a responsibility uh, to speak out. And, and if we don't do that, we are again failing to be the Church of Jesus Christ. I suppose it's a difficult thing, isn't it? <laughs> That's always the, the hardest thing is to speak out and to put, put one's head above the parapet. Yeah, it, it is hard to put your head above the parapet, but speaking as somebody who has put their head above the parapet from time to time, I've always found the air above the parapet is fresh and lovely, um, that there's something liberating and energizing about actually saying, OK, some people aren't going to like this. And these are uncomfortable truths. Um, but actually, it's the right thing to do. And, and there is, you know, it, it's good to know that you're doing the right thing. So I would encourage you know, anybody and everybody that if, if you're involved in St. George's Crypt, if, if you know about the realities of homelessness in Leeds and across our region, um, don't be silent about this. Uh, OK, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be blaming people. We shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't be speaking ungraciously. But our politicians at national level and local level need to be need to be reminded that some of the reason that this happens is as, is as a direct result of policies and those policies, this is what is happening. Now, we're not suggesting you meant it to happen, but it is happening. And we need to come face to face with those uncomfortable truths. You know, the, the changes that have been made to the credit system and universal credit and the bedroom tax and all of that. I'm not saying people meant that to lead to increased homelessness and child poverty, but actually that is what's happened. I think that's what we see a lot is, is, is it, it's, it, I suppose it's an uncomfortable reality that people don't particularly want to be taxed more to pay more money into a system where they're looking at because people don't people do generally it's a sad truth of it isn't it people look down on the homeless and i think in a broader sense there are lots of different parts of sort of, of need and pockets of needs that people just people they well people don't just pull your finger out get a job sort yourself out kind of mentality and <laughs> we come we, we do we come up against this a lot and and so sort of how to explain to people that actually you do need to have investment in people you do need to look at sort of the massive underlying needs and it's not only homelessness it goes far beyond and mm. and and that and that sort of that 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 conversation is is a tricky conversation to have <laughs> The easy thing for Christians to do, still good to do, but the easy thing to do, and still hard to do, but the easy thing to do is is simply to, you know, give give charitably for places like St George's Crypt, and I encourage people to do that. Um, but I think once you start examining why is someone homeless, what are the reasons behind it, what what can be done to alleviate it and get somebody back into the mainstream of life, you very quickly come face to face with 
you know, political issues, policies that different governments at different levels have made. And I think it's incumbent upon us to not pretend that we've got all the answers, but also not shy away from speaking the truth about this, however uncomfortable. And yes, do it in a very gracious way. But we do need to do it. I think it is part of the, the Christian vocation. I think our general overarching thought, because it's difficult, isn't it, when you're placed in a, in a city and you're sort of, you're not, where, as you say, we are a well-known charity, but we are still a charity. We try, we try our best not to be overtly political and we try and work with, with, with the city in the best way that we possibly can because at the end of the day we, we, we want to we want to stop as many people from being homeless as we possibly can but no, then, I, oh. I was gonna say I, I i think it's the job of the wider church to speak into these things i think you, your 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 job is focused upon the very real needs of the very real people that you are ministering to and with every day but I think the wider church pe people like me it's it's our job to to make the connections and to speak out and and other Christians as well as as opportunity arises um, but I mean the other thought I've had particularly this year um, uh, with COVID-19 I'm thinking back to those weeks in lockdown where on Thursday evenings we all stood outside and cheered the NHS, which was obviously a right thing to do and felt good to do it and became, you know, for a month or so, it became a way of drawing the nation together. But I've, I've thought to myself, what were we cheering? Well, of course, first and foremost, we were cheering the NHS. But I think we were also cheering something else. We were cheering a set of ideas um, about the world we want to inhabit. Because the NHS is cherished in our national life. And on the whole, cherished beyond party political um, divisions. And that is quite unusual in British society. Um, and the idea behind it, which is the idea that we cherish, is that everyone, as a matter of right, has access to health care on a reasonably equal footing. That's the idea. And it's a beautiful idea. And it's not an idea that you will find in every country. And it wasn't an idea in our country, you know, 75, 80 years ago. I don't think it is. it requires such a stretch of an imagination to say that beautiful idea that everyone has access to health care should be applied to other things, such as a roof over your head. Um, and, and that's the way coming out of um, COVID-19, I think we've still got a, you know, another year to go probably, but, but it will pass. Coming out of that, I, I hope we can have a national debate about this to say there are ideas that we cherish and we all hold, you know, pretty much all of us hold, hold dear. Um, is there something else about those ideas that we really need to pay attention to about basic, basic human needs of which I would say, you know, I think most people would say, if you said, what do human beings need? You'd say, well, food on your table, a roof over your head. You'd probably say that before healthcare, actually. And you say they are the, the most basic things. So what's happened if we cherish healthcare as something and go out on the streets and clap it, but accept uh, food poverty and homelessness? There's a disconnect there that I think we would be wise to acknowledge. Yeah, <laughs> and I think, but then it's, it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's, it's a hard one, isn't it? It's that, that these things have, that these things exist in the, in the way that they do, and that we don't, we don't face it. But then I, I'd, I'd second that in that I've been having lots of conversations 
with 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 a broad range of different people within the city about basically about exactly that about what's going to happen after covid and how are we going to what are we going to do once once covid's finished because there's been a lot of work happening there's been lots of good partnerships coming about there's been lots of lots of sort of is in a way it's acted as a rallying cry to an awful lot of community groups and then sort of grassroots community groups grassroots christian community groups and and then there's this sort of re the, the rhetoric going behind this all of but then how do we keep all of that going but i think there is this underlying will and wish to keep all of that work going that there, there needs to be a different way and that we need to be more focused on Mm. ourselves as humanity rather than rather than just just out just pure pure selfish capitalist greed well perhaps I, I, I'm probably running out of things to say but perhaps my last word would be um, a narrative of hope uh, that does seem to me to be central to the Christian way of looking at the world uh, that we are not people who give in to despair we have this great hope um and uh and it is that hope uh which i mean it comes it comes from christ because at the heart of the christian faith is this radical idea that we belong to each other i mean it's right there at the beginning of the lord's prayer we we say our father now, I don't think we stop to consider what astonishingly radical, what a radical statement that is. First of all, to call God a father, a parent, my, you know, a mother as much as a father. But it's the word our, which I think is the really radical word, our. Because as soon as you say our father, you are by implication declaring sisterhood and brotherhood with the whole human race. Um. So that, that radical idea is at the very heart of the Christian faith, that we belong to each other and the, the old barriers of separation no longer count. Um, very hard for us to live it out, um, uh, and we, we fail to live it out. Um, but that's the idea uh, that is distinctive to the Christian faith and is not self-evident from observation of the world, observation of the world would not lead you to this conclusion um so uh so therefore we have this great hope uh the the the, the life of the earth can mirror uh the unity goodness reciprocity generosity that we see in god